Thank you for coming tonight to our international dinner. We're really excited that you're here tonight. This is a record crowd of 120 people and more. We have some students that are visiting from the uh, Wasa School District that are just attending for enrichment. So we have a record crowd here tonight. I hope you've enjoyed your evening. A cultural safari. In March of 2017, Nancy Hesser and Gary Stack, along with 12 other fellow travelers, set out on an overseas adventure tourism tour excuse me, called the Ultimate Safari. Nancy Hessert spent 34 years here at the UWMC as a Spanish professor. She is now retired. She's broadening her travels beyond Spain and now into the African continent. Gary Sack has retired from his medical practice in northern Wisconsin, and as a longtime student of the vast variety of human cultures, he travels as much as his time will allow and that is his pastime and interest. With much ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers tonight. Please give a round of applause. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Dumela, hello. Welcome to our little safari through the central part of Southern Africa. I'm going to begin the uh, tour with a little bit of historical background to paint a picture of what we found when we got to the three countries we visited in the south of Africa. And I'll begin, it's kind of hard to decide where to begin, but I'm, I'm going to begin in the early part of the 19th century when Great Britain took over the Cape Colony, which is down at the, well, let's see. First I'll have to learn how to use this thing down at the very southern tip of, uh, of Africa. The, the pointer's not working for me, but, but where Cape Town presently is, that was the Cape Colony that had been founded 150 years earlier by the Dutch East India Company. And the British took over early 1900s and uh, created a real dilemma for the Afrikaner farmers who lived in that part of Africa in that the British did not allow slavery, and the Afrikaner farmers had long been dependent on slavery to run their farms. This accelerated a movement which was referred to as trekking to the north uh, out of the Cape area to the north where they would go looking for other places to establish new colonies where they could continue the lifestyle that they knew and loved. As they did this, they pushed other peoples, other native tribes, out of their, the areas they were taking over. And they moved north toward what is now Johannesburg, and they pushed some tribes into the land of the Tswana people, Botswana. And the Tswana chiefs came back to the British and asked, they said, these long-standing enemies of ours are moving in, taking over our country. Would you provide us some protection? The British, of course, said yes. And Botswana became a British protectorate, which they called Beshwana land. Now, what the difference is between a protectorate and a colony is, I really can't tell you. But they were, they were, they considered it important to tell us that. Beshwana land was not a colony, and this was one of the very few parts of Africa that was never really formally colonized. In the middle part of the 19th century, interest in the, in the dark continent was much like space travel in the 1960s. Everybody was curious, in, in particularly the Americas and in Europe. So many adventurers, many explorers came south to uh, go into the interior to, to see what was going on there. And one of these was a Scottish missionary by the name of David Livingstone. He was a very inept uh, a missionary. He was hard put to convert anybody to Christianity, but he was an intrepid explorer, a very, very uh, uh, brave explorer, uh, persevered, found a lot of new places, a lot of new tribes. And one of the places he found was up here, a place called Mosi Oatonio, 
the mist that roars, and he renamed it Victoria Falls on the, Zamb the Zambezi River. Toward the end of the century, in the late 19, uh, 1800s, a sickly teenager was sent south from northern England by his family, hoping that the dry air in southern Africa would do his lungs some good. He got to southern Africa down to the Cape Colony and began working in the mining industry. <clears throat> he proved to be a very adept uh, uh, businessman, a shrewd politician. He cornered the market on diamond mines, established the De Beers Corporation, and became enormously wealthy. He was, of course, Cecil Rhodes. Now, Cecil was a strong believer that British culture was the best thing that ever happened to mankind, and he felt that the British should control a swath of land from the Cape Colony in the south all the way up to Cairo, which they controlled in the north, and build a railroad that would run the ex ex uh, extreme length of, of Africa. To that end, he began searching from the Cape Colony north looking for mining opportunities as well as a route for his railroad. When he got up to this area, he discovered what is now considered the breadbasket of Africa, the best farmland in all of Africa. And he uh, declared this a new colony for Great Britain, which he called Zambezia. But when the colonists came to farm the land, most of them British, they referred to it as Rhodesia, after Cecil's last name, and they separated it into two colonies along the Zambezi River, so it was northern Rhodesia and southern Rhodesia. And that's the way things remained going well into the 20th century. After World War II, as uh, Europe was trying to rebuild uh, from the destruction of the war, Peoples around the world that had been colonized were pressing for their independence, and that was in Africa as well as pretty much everywhere else. The first of our three countries to become independent and to declare a new country was Northern Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe in 1964. Uh, Botswana here was uh, Botswanaland became a new country in 1966. But there was a real problem in southern Rhodesia, as many of you remember, they had a prime minister by the name of Ian Smith. And Ian and the white farmers knew they had a really good thing going there and they were really afraid of what would happen when the natives took over. The natives were to some extent threatening to just take the farms away. So they refused to allow uh, an election to be held and a new government to be established. This caused outrage around the world. The United Nations pressed uh, strong trade sanctions against southern Rhodesia in 1970. Although enough countries continued to trade with them that they were able to limp along financially. And uh, two guerrilla groups rose up through the 70s to fight against the, the white uh, colonizers, the white farmers. Uh, but these two groups had very different ideas of what should happen. They didn't really get along very well, so they fought amongst themselves almost as much as they fought against the, uh, the white farmers. So that finally, in 1980, Great Britain interceded, and in order to resolve the problem, they uh, worked out a deal whereby there would be an election, they would be able to establish a native culture, a new country, but they would guarantee that what they, they referred to as a willing seller, willing buyer agreement that only when a white farmer wanted to sell his property would that sale take place and Great Britain would fund the purchase by the government of that, of that farmland. So an election was held in 1980 and uh, the leader of one of the uh, rebel militias was elected Initially, he was elected prime minister. He later became president, and that man was Robert Mugabe, who has remained president until a couple of weeks ago uh, as the president of the country. So that's the way we found it when we got there, and Nancy will begin our tour. 
Okay, so Botswana is the first country that we'll visit. Botswana is a landlocked country in uh, southern Africa. It is about the size of Texas, but only 2.1 million people, so fairly sparsely populated. It's a, a progressive country for this area. Uh, in um, 1966, they did receive their independence, as Gary said. In 1967, they discovered diamonds in Botswana. And since the government owns all the land, then the government used that money, or is using that money, to pay for hospitals and education. So they're, they're fairly progressive. They're very interested in conservation and in uh, ecotourism. They're protecting their land as well. Um, in their national parks, for example, uh, no one can use a, a weapon, uh, any kind of arm, including our guides, which was interesting. So no weapons at all in the national parks. This is the Botswana flag, and it is to represent uh, the white minority and the black majority, but in unity under the, the blue sky of Botswana. This is our first camp, Baobab Camp is the name, and that's a tree, a very important large tree for this environment. And this is the typical welcome. Uh, usually the staff would come out all in their uh, finest staff clothes and uh, greet us with a song. So we're being wel welcomed here, and this is in the Chobe National Park in uh, Botswana. Inside, we're uh, settling in. Uh, you can see it's open air, lovely, lovely spot. On uh, the left, uh, let's see, here we go. Left of the fireplace here is our guide, Sanction Zhao. And Gary just told you about the sanctions in Zimbabwe. Sanction was from Zimbabwe, or is from Zimbabwe, and he was born at a time when his father heard that word, and so he decided to name him Sanction. That was his first name. And Sanction stayed with us for the whole trip, including all the way down to Cape Town, where we uh, wound up our trip in South Africa. This is how we started each day. We would get up in the morning, have breakfast, and then set off in two different Jeeps. Since we were a group of 14, we split up seven and seven, and we would rotate uh, through the days and, and mix it up, but uh, we would have one safari guide, uh, plus uh, sanctions getting in, in this Jeep as well. And so we would have a safari uh, drive or game drive in the morning and then uh, toward the later afternoon. This is a uh, member of the Baiai tribe. Uh, this is a group of hunter-gatherers, one of the few hunter-gatherer tribes left in the world. They are prim primarily fishermen. We are looking from Botswana across the Chobe River into the Caprivi Strip of Namibia. And he's fishing by slapping the water, stunning the fish, and then he scoops the fish into his dugout canoe, the Makoro. This is the fast food of Africa, at least in this part of Africa. Uh, this is an impala. And a kudu female. There are several species of zebras. The most common are the plains zebras, and there are several subspecies. This is a Burchell's uh, subspecies, a plain zebra, and you can tell the Burchell's by the shadow stripes between the dark stripes. More zebras and a giraffe, a pack of hyenas, a chakma baboon and her baby, and a male chakma baboon. We saw several species of mongoose uh, on the trip. This is a banded mongoose, one of the larger types. Black-backed jackals were very common. They're very, very similar to our coyotes. And the homely warthog, <laughs> homely but fairly dangerous animal. These are flowers that were blooming in the trees uh, in northern Botswana when we arrived. This is the teak tree flower. 
One of the more striking birds we saw, there are a lot of beautiful birds in Africa. It pays to be a birder when you go. Uh, this is a lilac-breasted roller. And a double-banded sand grouse. There are several species of chats. This is a familiar chat. Many species of eagles. This is the African fish eagle. The open-billed stork, open-billed for obvious reasons. African darter. The spur-winged goose. This is an interesting bird called the long-tailed paradise wida. These birds, the male and female, are a drab gray-brown most of the year, but during mating season, the male develops this colorful plumage and this enormously long tail, which makes it extremely difficult for them to fly. And it mystifies me why they're not all killed by predators uh, because of that tail. But they are able to breed. However, they parasitize other birds. They lay their eggs in the nests of the green-winged tilia, and the, the tilias raise their young, probably because all the dads got killed by the predators. <laughs> This is another photo of the same, same bird. This is a European bee eater. We saw several different bee eaters. Sandpipers were pretty much anywhere you found water. Another of the many eagle species, this is a steppy eagle. We saw several species of hornbills. This is a red-billed hornbill for obvious reasons. There are several species of snake eagles. This is the brown snake eagle. The blacksmith plover. Maybe the prettiest of the birds we saw is a carmine bee eater. These animals, when they take off, they gather in huge flocks, and when they take off, the whole sky turns pink and russet. This is a, a Burschold starling, one of the less common types of the many species of starlings around the world. Another hornbill, this is the ground hornbill. We had the good fortune of catching one in a tree, which is pretty rare. This is the national flower of Zimbabwe. We only saw it in northern Botswana. It's called the flame lily. And of course, we saw African elephants in each of the countries. Well, now we're going to go into a, a village, and uh, this woman standing in front of the house that she built by herself. Uh, you can tell the house is like cinder block. She built one room and then added on another room. Uh, quite an interesting woman. She is the director or founder of a women's cooperative that uh, weaves baskets, and you may have seen some of ours out on the table. I hope you did, or check them out uh, later when you when you leave. Well, she uh, does a lot of things besides baskets and building houses. Here she is drying wild spinach that she has gathered uh, from the woods. She um, used to have to carry water, spend a lot of time going about a half a mile to the river and back again with water. But the town has just recently put in uh, a spigot that is available for public use and it's very close to her house. So uh, she has more time to do these kinds of things. That's Sanction again, our guide. And here we are approaching the compound where they have the women's cooperative. Uh, you can see it's a traditional building with the thatch roof and uh, a pole fence. And we're getting a traditional welcome, as always, with uh, this time uh, singing, dancing, and some fairly fancy outfits on, on those women. So they really uh, dressed up for us. Here are some of their lovely baskets that they have learned to weave and that they are weaving. Most of these women are actually grandmothers. 
They look pretty young by our standards, but, uh, they, and in fact, some of them were carrying uh, children on their backs, uh, like an eight month old or so. And why is that? Well, the mothers are off working elsewhere, and so the grandmothers are left to take care of the children. Gary and I, of course, had to buy baskets. So this is the one that Gary bought, and you probably saw it out there, with the weaver who did it, and the basket that I bought as, as well as the weaver. Uh, now we're going to fly uh, from this uh, northern part of Botswana to the Okavanga Delta. And if you remember the map, uh, it is, uh, Botswana is a country that's landlocked. So how do they have a delta? Our, our idea, our concept of a delta is a river that flows into the sea, right? Like the Mississippi or uh, the Nile or something like that uh, with a delta at the end. But this is an inland delta formed also by rivers and because it was the rainy season, uh, it was uh, definitely filling up. So here's our approach to our uh, main building at the um, Maremi Wildlife Refuge and our new camp. This is the interior again, quite, quite nice. And we would meet in the afternoons uh, for uh, discussions here or lectures, but also have our meals in this building, also open air. And here's the approach to Peter's and my uh, cottage uh, or our little uh, camp there and uh, you can see it's kind of on the edge of a of a lake that was fast filling up and we had the pleasure in the evening and at night of uh, going to sleep to um, munching hippos right outside our door uh, enjoying the vegetation out there and uh, once in a while interspersed we'd hear uh, the roar of a lion in the distance This is our uh, Macoral tour into the, into the delta. Uh, these are, of course, not dugout canoes. These are fiberglass renditions of the traditional Macoros. Uh, and our guides were members of that same Baye tribe, the Yeye people. And they are very adept at pulling these, uh, these canoes through the, the swamps and pointing out the crocodiles and the hippopotamuses and uh, other, other manner of wildlife that you see around the water. Here we are, as Nancy mentioned, this was the rainy season. They had just come off of four years of, of drought and had the worst flooding they had had in over 75 years. Major highways were washed out, bridges were washed out. These dirt roads that we would normally find very difficult to traverse anyway were flooded. Uh, if you notice, the air intake for the carburetor on these vehicles is on a snorkel above the hood for the very reason that they get in over their heads in water. And we, we did get in over the, over the hood several times on the trip uh, and in fact got stuck with the vehicle in over its uh, hood. More of the uh, flora and fauna. This is a long-tailed starling, probably the least common starling we saw on the trip. A tawny eagle. This is a what's now referred to as a red-necked spur fowl. These used to be referred to as Franklins, but of course the taxonomists have to change the name every once in a while just to keep us honest. Yellow-billed stork. The curious-looking knob-billed duck. White-faced whistling ducks. One of the several species of kingfishers we saw on the trip. This is a pied kingfisher. A family of Egyptian geese. This is a verose giant eagle owl. And if you look close at his eyes, he's got a little pink eyeliner above the eyes. <laughs> this is another kingfisher, but this is the only kingfisher that doesn't fish. 
These are uh, woodland kingfishers, and they live in the jungle eating insects, uh, small mammals, small rodents. Uh, an uncommon hornbill, Bradfield's hornbill. This is an interesting bird for many reasons. This is a battalure eagle. Battalure, this, this is a, it's not a, a threatened species, but it's approaching that. Uh, battalure is a French word that means street performer. It also means tightrope walker. These birds have a very short tail, and if you ever watched an eagle fly, they stabilize themselves by tilting their tail and their air currents. These guys can't do that with their tail, so they bob their wings from side to side, much like a tightrope walker with their balance uh, pull. This is an endangered species. This is a red lechway. Uh, lechways live only along swampy land, so they're probably most common in Botswana. And the hippopotamus. Now it's very tricky to get a picture of a hippopotamus because they only come out of the water at night and eat the grasses around the water. They go back in and stay most of the time submerged. They'll come up like this once in a while because they are very prone to getting sunburned. And this is a water buck. Okay, we're, we're moving on. We're going to fly to Kasani and then go into Zambia, our second country. Uh, but if you notice, uh, out on this tarmac, we would have two rather small planes to accommodate our group. This is one of them. But somebody's been here before us. Uh, those are elephant footprints. Luckily, he wasn't there when we wanted to take off. Here you can uh, see the map with uh, Kasani uh, right here in the airport. So we're going to be crossing the Zambezi River in order to get over to, I guess it's up here, over to Zambia. So uh, as we approached in our bus, as we approached that river crossing, um, we could see backed up for miles trucks, great big semi-trailers, just one right after another for several miles backed up from the waterfront. And so what was going on? Well, they don't have a bridge yet. Uh, we'll see some building in progress. But uh, because of that, they depend upon one ferry. And this is a ferry that will only take one large truck at a time across the river and they only run 12 hours daylight. So that's why the huge backup, trying to get products across the river and uh, to another country. Well, what happens when you have a lot of uh, mostly male truck drivers with nothing to do for several days? Well, they, um, if they need cash, they siphon the gas out of their tanks and sell it, and then they maybe uh, find the nearest bar or the nearest prostitute. So that's this gal who has come on, on board our bus, sanctioned, uh, talked her into talking to us, and um, probably uh, um, in her 20s, I would say. She's been doing this for a number of years, mostly because she had no other uh, source of support uh, her family, it seems to me her parents had died of AIDS, and um, so what was she to do? So she is now um, HIV positive, and you may know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there, that's 75 to 80 percent of the HIV and AIDS cases traditionally in the world have occurred there. And uh, things are improving. She, for example, is on medicine for the HIV, and that seems to be provided either by the government or by NGOs. Uh, she has some ambition to um, earn enough money to start her own grocery store, but a, a very difficult situation. And this may go on for a couple years. This is the bid, uh, bridge building process here, uh, but the first bridge that they tried to build collapsed. 
So they're on their second try. They now have the South Korean government, or at least uh, engineers, helping them. And uh, they hope to be done in two to four years. But uh, progress is slow. So we were taking this shuttle, this little, little boat over here, seven of us at a time uh, across the water so we didn't have to wait. It was there waiting for us. And uh, that gets us to Zambia. Here's the flag of Zambia. And we go directly to the market, which was interesting. These are some of the staples, of course, uh, cornmeal and, and flour, uh, dried goods, but also dried fish. And this is their source of protein and very popular in this area. Um, very necessary part of the diet. But they also had gorgeous vegetables, especially this time of year with uh, lots of rain and sunshine as well. Uh, you know, on the, the dirt streets of the village in the market, there was an elderly gentleman who had these doors set up for sale. We had trouble communicating, but I was just infatuated with this hand-carved uh, uh, ebony door, so I tried to find out what it would cost to buy this, and the best I could find out it would be about a hundred dollars. That door in the states would sell for many thousands of dollars. Everywhere you go in the world, uh, kids love to get their pictures taken. Many of these kids have never seen a, <clears throat> a mirror; they don't know what they look like themselves. And if you can take their photo with a digital camera and show them what they look like, they, they just they break into laughter. They love it. This is the airport in Livingstone where we were going to take off to fly to our camp in, uh, in Zambia. And out front are these copper statues. Uh, copper is mined extensively in Zambia. These are pure copper statues of David Livingston and his two long-standing trusted aides, Chuma and Susi, who nursed him through malaria many times. And when he died, they arranged for his body to be shipped back to be buried in Winchester Cathedral, but they removed his heart because he had told them that his heart belonged to Africa. So they buried it under a tree in Zambia. Okay, we're arriving at our next camp. It's called Kafui, and uh, this is in, in Zambia. You can see, again, the group welcoming us, and I'd like you to notice especially uh, there are about five women in, in darker shirts, and they are interns here. It was a very well-run camp, and these women are there learning the business of tourism and, and running a camp. Here are some of them out on the deck. This is why I love this camp, because it had this beautiful deck out over the, the river. And uh, some of them are dressed up for our uh, traditional tea time in the afternoon. Here's another shot of the deck. Uh, looking out at the two rivers, this was the junction of the Kafui and Lunga rivers. And actually, this is where our guide, Sanction, from Zimbabwe, decided he would give his talk. We're in Zambia. But he did not want to give his talk on Zimbabwe, on the government, because he was quite critical of it, and the economy in Zimbabwe. He was not going to take a chance of doing that in Zimbabwe for fear of secret police or even informants at the camp. So, we listened to his talk on Zimbabwe right here. Uh, we were also told that we should never bring food into our cabins or our uh, tents. So we would leave even wrapped granola bars up in the main lodge and they would, they would put those away, lock them up. But um, our neighbors next to Peter's and my cabin, uh, these gals, one of them had brought back after lunch her peach that she didn't eat, you know. So she put that down on the desk inside the cabin. 
And uh, pretty soon she had these visitors. I, I don't think she knew it, but we could see them. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, one of those monkeys figured out how to get in between the screening. There was always screening and a roof, how to get in and stole that peach. I saw him come out with uh, something in his paw, uh, something round. They also, um, told us about doing our laundry. Well, they would do our laundry for us, except for our smalls. Smalls is the term they use for underwear. So they said, if you're doing anything, any kind of laundry or have anything to dry, don't hang it out on the railing of your, of your cabin because uh, you'll find it in the trees. You know? <laughs> so the monkeys are busy. You can see the water coming up. Uh, waters are rising in uh, this area. I included this slide as an educational process for you guys for next summer. Um, everywhere we went, the, the guides would attach a small can on the back of the vehicle in which they would burn elephant dung for mosquito repellent. So next year, when you're sitting on the patio being bothered by mosquitoes, here's the solution. Peter and I have long fished together around many places, and uh, we had the opportunity to fish in each of the countries in Africa. We found uh, several, several of the staff at each of the camps who are avid fishermen, and they were willing to take us out. So we went out, this gentleman's name is Golden. He took us out fishing one day. And we caught enough tilapia that we were able to show the staff how to make ceviche and we made, they had cornmeal, so we made hush puppies. This is me showing the camp chef how to make ceviche. That's why we had ceviche for hors d'oeuvres today. We had a heck of a time convincing the staff that it was safe to eat. They just couldn't get their mind wrapped around the idea that fish uh, in, in lemon juice was cooked. But once they tried it, they loved it. And I've talked to Sanction, or I've emailed back and forth, most recently with Sanction about the Mugabe takeover. And uh, he said he's still fishing, still, still making ceviche for his friends and family. So it was quite a hit. This is, I asked the, the local folks to give me the names for, for the, uh, the foods we had. And they did. Uh, Banabacabo Kaboja is hush puppies that literally translated would be shut up dogs. <laughs> and Nasoma Namandimu is fish in lemon juice, ceviche. This is a Mopani worm. It's the it's a caterpillar of a moth that are all over sub-Saharan Africa by the billions. And they are a major source of protein for the people everywhere. This is what they look like served. They're actually quite tasty and they're uh, hugely rich in protein. We didn't eat any on this trip, however. <laughs> but, but aren't you glad that we didn't have Mopani worms? We wanted to have Mopani worms tonight. But <laughs> But we couldn't swing that. Well, here's one of the interns that I told you about uh, in, in her native dress. And uh, she's giving a little uh, talk and demonstration about fabrics. You know, they can wrap these fabrics. You might have seen our fabrics on the table as well. But they can wrap them around and make skirts. They can wrap them around their back and carry a child. They even make a, a kind of a, a twine up here. And then they can balance things on their, on their heads with them. So she was giving a demonstration. but. Because um, of her culture, she is used to uh, looking downcast or aside. She would never look you in the eye in her culture because that is confrontational. So one of the things that she was learning and practicing was to, to look us in the eye because that's what Americans expect, right? That's what we're used to. And, and we would think if somebody looked down that they weren't interested or uh, they weren't very friendly or whatever. Uh, so that, that was uh, hard for her, but she was doing very well. And here we are 
this was very hard for us, trying to balance those, uh, just the fabric on our heads, much less something else above it. Uh, but we were uh, given the chance to practice. This is uh, perhaps the rarest bird that we saw on the trip, and Peter and I didn't get to see it. Uh, he and I were out fishing that day, and the rest of the, of the crew got to watch this bird flying around. This is a Pell's fishing owl, and they're the only owl, to my knowledge, that make a living fishing. However, Pete and I got to see this little guy, another kingfisher, a very small little kingfisher, very colorful, called the Malachite kingfisher. These are wattled plovers, another eagle, the African hawk eagle, a bad photo of a very pretty little red bird called the red bishop, the gray heron, the white banked vulture, an interesting, striking little bird called the hammerkop, which means hammerhead for obvious reasons. There are quite a few species of weaver birds in Africa. This is a white-browed sparrow weaver. And this is actually a dilemma. This, this, I'm the only one in the, in the camp to see this animal. It was behind my tent one day. Um, I, asked, I showed the pictures to the staff and they weren't sure what it was. I've done a lot of research since. The best I can tell, it's a Nyala. The problem is Nyalas are very, very rare. And particularly in this part of Zambia, they're, they're very rare. So unless proven otherwise, we'll call it a Nyala just because it's kind of cool to say you saw one, but, but I, I'm not really certain. This is a vervet monkey. There's another name for this monkey based on his anatomy. <laughs> These are wildebeests or gnus, blue gnus. On a night game drive, we found a chameleon one night and another large owl called the giant eagle owl. Now here's the flag of Zimbabwe and I'll mention the flag only in passing in that it's felt that uh, the bird is a Battalore eagle, and that statue, it's a rendition of a statue that exists in the great Zimbabwe, which was the capital city of an ancient culture that existed from about uh, the 11th century to the 15th century in the south of the country, and that's actually, it's the, the great Zimbabwe, that culture that the country takes its name from. Here we are at the border crossing. Of course, Zimbabwe doesn't get along with, it, with its neighbors very well. We had to dismount our Botswanan bus, walk through customs, pay our $30 cash only visa, have our x-rays, uh, our luggage x-rayed, and then mount the bus on the other side to go into camp. Okay, and this welcome included uh, some drums uh, to the left of the, the large drum is the director of the camp. And this is Hawangi, one of the largest and oldest parks in Zimbabwe. Here you can see the drums out in what's called the boma. A boma traditionally is where the, uh, the villagers would gather and where the chief would make uh, determinations or proclamations or where they decide issues. And so this was our, our boma where we would listen to talks and it had a gorgeous view because we're up on a hill here, a beautiful view out to the plains below where we could see elephants at times and other animals. And here we're, uh, we're at dinner or coming in for dinner uh, some of these animals, the carved animals you might have seen on the table, and they were all for purchase, mostly made by the staff in this, in this camp. So some of them are carved out of stone, some out of wood. Uh, this, this little one uh, here, this little elephant was actually made with wire and beads. Uh, you can see the giraffe that I bought, and this is, this, uh, I guess, Gary's aren't in this picture, but uh, it was fun to see them and buy them. This is Gary's cabin, 
Uh, at one point in time, one of his cabins, uh, they had the water coming up on the steps, uh, but this one looks uh, like it's okay. This was the view from Peter's and my cabin one evening, beautiful sunset over that plain below. Well, a grocery store. Why am I showing you a grocery store? This is in a town or a city, of course, and there's our guide, Sanction, once again, uh, buying some commodities for a visit that we're going to make to a village, a, a very small and rather primitive village. So we're driving, approaching here. You can see the uh, thatched roofs on the huts and also the uh, pole fence to keep the big animals out or the other animals in. Uh, a welcome, traditional welcome by the women of the village. Few kids around, of course. And uh, this woman spoke to us in English. This is a, a Diki tribe, but um, she had graduated from high school so that she had learned English at school. They teach uh, both languages in the local school there. Uh, uh, most of the other women, though, could not speak to us, and nor could we speak to them, but we showed them pictures on our uh, cell phones to give them a mic an idea of where we lived and what snow looks like, that sort of thing. We got a little tour through the compound. This is actually where the chief lives, and he has a TV set, and also a stereo. I don't know if you can see the wiring. Uh, they did have electricity, but that's quite a, a wiring uh, job there. And then in the men's uh, end of the compound, there was a bike, quite a nice bicycle, hanging up, but that was the only evidence of a vehicle. I never saw any, any cars or other bikes. This is where um, the women, of course, do all the dishwashing. Uh, here's a building that they were very proud of because it's a sturdy, permanent structure. This is the latrine. No running water, of course, so this is the long drop type of uh, latrine, they call it. Uh, but they were really pleased that they had a permanent building now for that. This is the shower, not quite so permanent, uh, but if you heated up a couple buckets of water, which you probably had to carry from uh, the nearest river or stream, and let them sit in the sun for a while, I guess you could get a warm shower with some sort of privacy there. Uh, women and children, it seemed like a tough life for women uh, they had a lot of work to do. They even work in the fields. They prepare, of course, all the meals. They do all the dishes. They take care of the children. Uh, the men primarily are out caring for the, the cows or the herds, and uh, that has to be done at night sometimes, too, just to protect the herds from uh, lions or from attack. This man is the, the medicine man. Uh, or a shaman, I guess you could call him. Uh, I wasn't sure about his credentials. He could speak some English to us, but he had a business card, so he must be uh, official, right? Here we're presenting our gifts to them, uh, what we bought for them, and uh, these are just the kinds of things that you saw in the market, the, the flour and the, and the cornmeal and those dried fish but they're very pleased. Now we're going to a nearby school. Uh, you can see the, the uh, flag of Zimbabwe and the students there. Uh, this is a private school, actually, uh, but um, it's, it was a re religiously affiliated, no longer is. It, the students are welcoming us, of course, with song. There are a lot of them, not here in this picture, but 810 students in this school, uh, 18 teachers. So that works out to 45 students per class, and a lot of the classes were even much larger than that. The principal told us she'd love to have more teachers, but it's an economic issue. Uh, the parents do pay uh, for the students. They have to pay $15 for a three-month term. The students go three months and then get one month off and back three months, but um, this is a very large class, as you can see here. Uh, no textbooks, but some paper workbooks. It's a national curriculum. Um, 
they were learning English so we could uh, communicate somewhat with them and uh, big smiles. They were glad to see us and uh, they, they do have now computers thanks to uh, the Grand Circle Foundation which, of which OAT is a part. Uh, so we contributed, I guess, in a way to those, but no internet. Uh, they do have to have a security fence, which they now do have around the school to protect some of those investments. We, uh, when you go to Africa, one of the big goals is to see the big cats. Because of the season and the flooding, we had a difficult time finding uh, the, the big cats. We did spot lions one day, but it was at a long distance, about a mile, a pride of probably about six lions. This is a gentleman, one of our guides, 75-year-old gentleman named Mufuka, who volunteered to take us on a hike for those who were willing to take the risk to try to get closer to the lions to get some photos. Most of us did it. He, of course, had to carry a rifle just in case. But we were able to close to, I would guess, probably within 400 yards. And we got some photos of lions. The lions saw us coming, I'm sure, long before we, we saw them. But uh, we didn't get, get close enough to be a problem. And we saw more elephants. This, uh, this is an interesting story behind this guy. This is a 10 or 11 foot long python in the road. A snake, another snake eagle. This is a bird called the gray Lowry, uh, also called the go-away bird. And a tawny eagle. Well, I'd like to tell you a story about Mafuka. He's not in this picture, but you just saw him guiding us on that uh, walk to see the lions. Uh, Mafuka, who is um, a 75-year-old man, uh, presented a, a talk one night in the BOMA, and he is a polygamist. And polygamy is legal as far as um, traditional village um, marriages go. So he has uh, three wives now. He had four. He divorced one. Uh, she didn't fit in because he said she felt superior. She was younger than the others. Uh, there were a lot of questions, especially from the women, uh, American women in that uh, group, and we wondered how, how does this work? Well, the uh, oldest, or the first wife, uh, plans the schedule. So uh, there, is, there is a schedule, and, uh, but he said, we're a family, we love one another, uh, it works just fine. He has 10 children and 20 grandchildren. In Botswana, or uh, this is Zimbabwe, you can have as many wives as, as you want if you can pay for them. It's a, you need to have the bride's price, which used to be paid in cows traditionally, but now is equated to about $2,000 per cow. So um, every wife will cost you. <laughs> but uh, then uh, the next, the next night, by contrast, we had a talk uh, from Sally here on the left, and I'm sorry we didn't get a better picture of her, but um, she is standing there before dinner and uh, next to the director of the camp, she is the assistant director. She was also the only woman in that camp, and she had a lot of men on the staff below her that she was supposed to be uh, organizing. She said when she first came, they just thought she was not capable, not intelligent, and uh, as some of us have experienced, she said, I had to work twice as hard. And I'm sure she did. But she had quite a life story. Um, when her mother was, um, had one child and was pregnant with uh, Sally, she found out that her husband was a polygamist. And so she separated from him and decided to raise her children herself as well as some of her own siblings that she had to raise because her parents had died of AIDS. Well, 
then when Sally got to high school, she uh, became pregnant. And of course, she could no longer continue in school. That was the rule. But she wanted to continue her education, so she hoped to stay in town. But it was her father who had not played any part in her life up till this point, as far as I could figure out. Uh, he, it was he who could make the decision whether she could stay in town with her mother or whether she had to go to one of those fairly primitive villages that we saw with her aunties. And the father decided that she must go. So she went and had a very difficult life for uh, some time until her sister uh, brought her back. And then she finished high school. She also went on to get a degree in uh, college or a business school in, in tourism. And she's even working on an MBA online, even though internet is pretty intermittent at a camp like that. But I give her a lot of credit. Uh, she was uh, a very um, determined woman, and, and she, I think, will persevere. We're going to our last stop, and that's Victoria Falls. And it was, it was quite beautiful. While Peter and Gary went fishing up the Zambezi River, I went up in a helicopter and took a few pictures. So this one is of the Zambezi and Victoria Falls. You can see that it's huge. And we had been seeing the mist, for which it's named, the, the mist rising every time we'd approach in an airplane or uh, in a bus from miles and miles away, you could see this. And you can uh, walk along the Zimbabwe side, and uh, it's quite lovely, although you're going to get wet, especially in the rainy season, because of that mist coming off. Uh, we were in ponchos and rain gear. Another gorgeous place at Victoria Falls is the Victoria Falls Hotel, an old English hotel from the early 1900s. And um, this I took from the air, but we did get inside, and you can see it's absolutely lovely. We didn't stay there, unfortunately, but um, we did go there for high tea. So um, you will have some British tea cakes for your dessert tonight, English tea cakes. And I think that's the end of our presentation. We might have just a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, yes, we're going to go ahead and take some questions. We have about five minutes before we're going to separate for dinner. If you already have a spot in the Sonnentag, I would ask that you go back to that spot. And then, of course, there's 80 seats here on the stage. Um, that will go up so that you won't be sitting there with that. So does anybody have some questions? Let's start from this side. Anybody have any questions? Hi, what is the major religion in that area where you were touring? What is the major religion? Religion. religion? I think it's primarily, well, most of the people have uh, native religions, but I think Christianity would be the, the true church that they would most claim to belong to. And I think in all of these countries, that's true. And especially in Botswana, it seemed like there was more of a Christian you know, religion. Um, if you if you get married in a church, by the way, you can only have one spouse. <laughs> so polygamy is not uh, popular with so the churches. So churches were not popular traditionally, <laughs> which is why Livingston had a heck of a time converting people. Take one on that side. Yeah, why don't you take one on that side? What were your um, like bathroom facilities, <laughs> and did you have running water, and were you able to shower? And the camps, I mean, they're tents, but they're very nice. The the beds are nice. The the bathrooms are acceptably nice. Some showers are better than others. Some have wooden slat floors, and others have tile floors. It's it, it's really quite. Nice. But it's all indoor plumbing. It's all indoor plumbing. Yeah, yeah. I was worried about that. I've but... been to camps where that was not the case, but uh, most of the time, you're gonna you're gonna have very acceptable pl plumbing. At one point, we had um, showers that were working on uh, solar energy, and those were very very slow to warm up. 
<laughs> but otherwise, it was it was very good. Um, so, did um, any of the what are the like three major languages besides uh, English there countries you went to? Pretty much everyone speaks English, and in all these countries, they teach English in the schools, but they speak. You know, in Botswana or in uh, Zambia, it's uh, Shona and Nubeli. Uh, those are the two prominent tribes, so they teach both of those in the schools. All these countries treat, teach multiple tribal languages as well as English. And uh, some of them teach German, some of them were German colonies, some were, uh, you know, there were some, a few French colonies further north where they speak French. But uh, English is taught pretty much everywhere at least later on in school. You, you talked about the, the, the kids in school. Um, once they finish, I guess, our, uh, our high school, it would be, are there other opportunities for them to, co to continue their education? And once they're done with that, what are the economic opportunities for them? You, know, you talked about the tourism, apparently, is a, is a big business in uh, in those countries and mining in some of them but what other economic opportunities for them are, uh, are there in those those countries obviously it's hugely evolving now uh, changing as we speak um, yes there are opportunities to go to other schools I met a I met a girl in Tanzania who was the first female to ever get an education she was a member of one of the click language uh, hunter-gatherer tribes no one had ever gotten an education before she was hoping to come to the u.s to go to college uh, there are universities in each of these countries some better some worse they often get opportunities particularly in the british colonies to go to england for a more advanced education job opportunities are these are poor countries and uh, people have cell phones they they transact business, but, but it's a difficult life. And we did hear that a lot of the, the, the uh, kids coming out of uh, college or the younger generation was moving away from the villages and towns and going to like the capitals or the major cities for the jobs. But they all maintain a very close allegiance to their old village, their old tribal village that's still home. And those people are still their family. You know, they all, their life is controlled by their uncles and, and aunties. That's just the way it is, you know. It's... I have a question. How were you so knowledgeable about the types of birds that you were seeing? Did you take photos and then bring them back to the guides and they were able to give you the... <laughs> uh, I had the, I, I've been to Africa multiple times and the first time I ever went, I went with a, a guy from Chennai, India, who's an avid birder. And he taught me a ton. And all the guides there, they, they work in the tourism industry, and they are expected to know pretty much everything about everything that a, a tourist could possibly ask. So they all have bird books with them all the time. So although I don't consider myself a birder, I've, I've learned an awful lot about birds and actually gotten pretty interested in birds because of the, of the trips and you know, learned enough that I can without too many mistakes, point out what kinds of birds these are. I kept a log of how many uh, animals and, and birds I saw, and I saw over 30 different species of animal and over uh, 60, 65 species of birds. So those were identified for me because I'm not really a birder, but they were identified by the, um, the guides who were driving our Jeeps. Those, those were the really good safari guides. You didn't seem to have a problem with mosquitoes like we do here, and yet you had them burning the... That's the, why we didn't. Uh, oh, you had, just got to get you your elephant supply. You didn't have to sleep under mosquito uh, netting? Yes, you slept with mosquito netting mm -hmm. every night. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they did have insect repellents uh, in, I think, in all the rooms, but I'm not sure we ever had to use them. I'm sure seasonally there are times when the bugs are worse than others, but... They're, they're really not a horrible problem. I never I, had a bite. And not, nor did I. <laughs> I have a question. So it sounds like mostly all your travels that you did, you did in a group. 
-hmm. How would either of you feel if you were to rent a car and go out through one of the parks like Hawaii by yourself? Would you feel comfortable? People do it. I would not do it. I'm just not courageous enough to do it. But people do do it, and, uh, and they do reasonably well, except every once in a while you hear about an elephant crushing a tourist from, from Idaho or something. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more tricky. When you're in a crowd, they, whenever we would get off the bus and they wanted us to have a chance to get out into the bush to go to the bathroom, they always went out and looked for lions and leopards and stuff because you don't want some guy trundling back into the jungle getting eaten by a leopard. And actually, I, I wouldn't do this on my own at all because the logistics on this trip, crossing borders, tricky borders, where you don't speak the language and, and you don't really understand the culture and you need to pay a certain amount in cash in American dollars, all, all those kinds of things. And then you need a ride from the airport and you need uh, all this transportation, private planes to get to some of those camps. I think it would be mind-boggling to figure it out. So um, we, we thought OAT did a great job. Did anybody get sick? Nope. I don't know that anyone ever had any GI problems at all. You would, every time you go on a trip, you just assume someone's going to get sick. To my knowledge, no one did. We're going to stop right now, so if we could give them a round of applause. They did a wonderful job.